and welcome to the Williamsburg Baptist Church virtual service on October 4th, 2020. We are pleased to have Art Wright join us again as our guest pastor. I have one announcement this morning. We are holding a drive through trunk or treat event on Saturday, October 24th from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. For more information, please visit our Facebook page. Let us now start the service with a call to worship. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We shall sing with courage and the strength of the Lord. How shall we sing the Lord's song when we feel so lonely? We shall sing of unity and faithfulness, of reconciliation and hope. Come, let us sing the Lord's song this day. Let us praise God in all our ways forever. Amen. my friends it's that time again time for this week's children's sermon please gather around your streaming device for this week's talk with children hey hey hello how are you guys doing today good how are you at home doing i hope for those of you who are in school that you've had a good week and that you're finally adjusting to the virtual learning pro platform my boys and I finally think that we're getting the swing of things, although there are some days that are a little easier to navigate than others. Did you know that today is a special day? Not only is it Sunday, it's Communion Sunday. It's something we do once a month to help us remember that Jesus died for us. First, we have a piece of bread, and that helps us to remember that Jesus' body was broken for us. Then we drink a little bit of grape juice. And that helps us remember that Jesus shed his blood for us. But today isn't just Communion Sunday, it's World Communion Sunday. That means the churches all around the world are having communion today, just like us. You know, it goes to show that the family of God is made up from them more than just Williamsburg Baptist Church. The family of God also includes the Presbyterian Church that's next door and the Methodist Church down the street. It even includes churches found in other parts of our country and ones that are on different continents and different countries. I think it's kind of neat that the family of God can be found all around the world and that today so many churches around the world are taking part in having communion. Jesus held the very first communion with his disciples on the night before he died. Today, God's family around the world will be having communion. And one day, Jesus is going to have communion with us. That's what it says in Matthew 26, verse 29. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Now that's something to look forward to. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, what a wonderful thing it is that we can join Christians around the whole world today in remembering that Jesus died for our sins. 
We especially look forward to the time we will be able to drink of the cup with him in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Until next time, we pray that you stay healthy and happy. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Before we move into a time of prayer, I'd like to give a brief word of welcome to you all. We are glad you're worshiping with us this morning, whether you are a longtime member or are brand new. We hope that this worship service is a chance for you to connect in meaningful ways with God and also this community of faith. For those of you who are watching at home, I want you to know that we don't see you as the audience of this service. Uh, even though you're watching on YouTube, we're not trying to get the most views on YouTube each week, believe it or not, and you won't see us running ads to try to increase the size of our offering. Rather, we believe that we are all participants together in worship and that God is the true audience of worship. In worship, we gather to offer the best that we have to God. And we recognize that it's difficult for many of us to feel like we can participate right now. It may be awkward to sing at home or to feel like you can participate in some meaningful way when you're simply viewing this on YouTube. But we believe that by gathering, even virtually, we are honoring God and God is pleased. Whether you are at home sitting on the couch in your Sunday finest while you watch, or whether you have a young child crying in your lap and uh, who has just spilled your coffee, your presence and your participation here matters as we worship God together. One additional word about today before we move into our time of prayer. You may not know this, but today is a special day uh, in the life of the church that's celebrated all over the globe. It's World Communion Sunday. World Communion Sunday is always the first Sunday in October, and it's a day where churches and denominations all over the world pause to acknowledge that we are all one in Christ and that we all come together in our common worship at table. This is a day to celebrate and pray for the unity of the global church and for a spirit of openness and cooperation among us all. When we celebrate communion later in the service, we will do it with an awareness that Christians all over the world are also participating in the sacred remembrance today. Now, let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. God, as we gather and worship today, not only here, but all over the world, bless us all as your children. Bless this congregation, bless the global church. Grant us all wisdom and lead us as we strive to be people of faith in this world. God, we confess that we are not always united as a church and we are not always united as people of faith Rather, we find that we are so often divided and at odds with one another, that our conflict with one another circumvents your spirit of peace and love. God, take from us the mistrust, the partisan spirit, any contention and all evil that divides us as your people. Work in us a desire for reconciliation so that we may pe be people who engage in the good work of the church with a single mind, united in our devotion for you. God, may we see in each other your light and your love. May it not matter our differences, our names, our languages, our looks, or our way of doing things. May what matters today and every day be that we are one in you. God, we also pray today and are mindful of those who cannot be with us in body or in spirit. May you bring comfort to those who are grieving, lonely, heartbroken, or ill. May you strengthen those among us whose lives feel shattered. May you speak a healing word to those who need it. And God, use us to shine your light into those whose lives and whose world feels covered in darkness. May you use us to feed the hungry, to clothe those who need clothes, to shelter the homeless, and to visit the sick and those in prison. 
May lives be awakened to you, Lord, to your love and to your kingdom, whose door is always open to all. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we gather and worship, we've already said that we are all participants in worship and that God is the audience. One of the ways that we participate in worship is that we respond. We respond to the words of scripture and the sermon. We respond in song and we also respond in giving. Your tithes and offerings and gifts to this congregation help us continue the vital ministry of this church in this challenging time. We are so grateful of those of you who continue to give faithfully week after week or month after month. And we know that your money is being put to good use as we strive to do our best to be the presence of God here in Williamsburg. If you would like to give, you have at least a couple of ways that you can do that. You can simply mail a check to the church, to the church office. Uh, and you can also click through the link below here in YouTube or the link that appears in the YouTube video itself. Know that uh, as you give, we are so grateful. Let, us, uh, let me offer a brief word uh, for our time of offering. Let us pray. God, we are so grateful for the ways that you move among us in ministry and mission in the life of this congregation. Continue to inspire us in creative and safe ways to be your presence in Williamsburg and in the world. God, receive these gifts that we offer you from the depths of our heart. Our money, yes, but also our time, our energy, our prayers, our creativity, our joy, and our hope. God, receive them and multiply them for your purposes in this world so that they might glorify you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God As we observe World Communion Sunday this week, we are taking a one-week pause from the lectionary readings and from the Gospel of Mark, which we have been in for some time now. 
Instead, this morning we find ourselves in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, and we'll be reading verses 1 and 4 through 14. I wonder if you will take a moment to turn to Jeremiah 29 with me. Receive these words. We pick up the reading in Jeremiah 29 with verse 1. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And now we'll skip down just a bit to verse 10. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and the places I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I can't help but think that they knew it was coming. They had to. The writing was on the wall, they had been warned, but still my hunch is that many of them felt that they were safe. There's no way it could happen to us, right? Perhaps it was hubris, perhaps it was an irrational hope that God would protect them or that they were somehow special. When the crisis came, it hit hard and it lasted more than a year and a half Trapped inside the walls of the city, desperation and depression set in, and the Jewish people waited anxiously for a return to normalcy that would never come. It was the year 587 BCE. The Babylonian Empire had been conquering much of the known world, so it shouldn't have come as a surprise to the Jewish people when the Babylonians surrounded their city and put it under siege. The crisis had come to their very doorstep, with the holy city surrounded by a hostile Babylonian army. And after nearly two years of siege, Babylonian soldiers, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, broke through the walls and destroyed the city. Jerusalem was conquered and destroyed. The city was razed to the ground. It was perhaps the darkest moment in the history of the Jewish people. The Babylonians took most of the wealthy Jewish elite into exile to Babylon, and only a few were left behind in what had once been the promised land. Most of those exiles would spend decades and decades in the far-off land of Babylon, wondering how in the world God could have allowed this to happen to them, and wondering when in the world things might go back to the way they used to be. It was a dark time. Psalm 137, which Scott read earlier as part of the call to worship, 
finds its origin in this period of exile, this period when so many Jewish people had been carting off, carted off to Babylon, mourning all that had been lost. If you have time later to go back and read Psalm 137 in its entirety, I would highly recommend it. It's fascinating and challenging. It's one of the most difficult texts in all of scripture. And plenty of Jewish and Christian readers alike have held it at arm's length for that reason. The psalm suggests the sadness, regret, depression, and despair, and even desire for re revenge that so many exiles felt. Here are just a few of these words. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Yet how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Psalm 137 invites us to imagine how hard it must have been for these Jewish exiles living in this strange new world. They weep for all that has been lost, knowing that life is now but a shadow of what it had once been. They have been separated from friends and family. They are living under an oppressive tyrant, surrounded by hostile Babylonian neighbors. They can no longer worship in their sacred space in Jerusalem. They can no longer sing the songs that they once held so dear. How is it possible to sing knowing that life is not as it should be? We might imagine them looking back and seeing how good they had it in the time before, and now they find themselves living in this strange, new, and dangerous world. It is into this moment and this context of fear and anxiety that Jeremiah, like so many of the Old Testament prophets, speaks. As we begin today's scripture reading in Jeremiah 29, the prophet has sent a letter from the ruins of Jerusalem to the exiles in Babylon. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Jeremiah's letter had traveled a long way to make it to these exiles, and they were no doubt eager and curious to hear what he had to say. After all, Jeremiah had spoken hard truths in the past, truths they needed to hear. What might he have to say now? My hunch is that the exiles were desperate for a word of hope, that Jeremiah would declare that the time of suffering was almost over, that any day now God would intervene, that the Babylonians would be defeated, that they would return to their homeland, that the temple would be rebuilt and life would go back to normal. And yet here is what Jeremiah advises instead. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, and so forth and so forth. This is what the prophet is saying. Settle down. Settle in. Find ways to live your lives, even now. You are going to be here for a while. This crisis is going to last longer than you would like it to. So you might as well get comfortable living in this strange new world. The temptation that so many of us feel right now is to just buy this time, to wait for things to go back to normal soon, hoping against hope that a vaccine will save us sooner rather than later. Hoping against hope that maybe everyone will wisen up and start wearing masks, that schools will reopen as normal, and that the economy will start humming along again. But Jeremiah says, wait a minute. Look down and realize where you're standing. You're in Babylon, not Jerusalem. 
and there is scant chance that you're going back to Jerusalem anytime soon. You need to find a way to live your life right now, to pick up the pieces and move forward in the world in a way that recognizes that this is all we have right now. This is our life to live, and there is goodness here in this place too. Moreover, Jeremiah issues a call to action, to, to mission really for the Jewish exiles. Verse seven, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Even though we find ourselves in exile, we are still people of faith. And God is calling us to be a blessing to the world. Whether you are in Jerusalem or Babylon or Williamsburg or stuck at home for months on end. We can't wait for life to go back to normal to do what it is that we are called to do as people of faith. So many of our churches have struggled with a bunker mentality during the pandemic. Move services online, yes. Pause programming, yes. But also, let's find safe and creative ways to do the work of the church and to be a light to our community in the, in the here and the now. We still have gifts to offer and the need is great. As we observe World Communion Sunday today, we acknowledge that the global church is struggling. People of faith all around the globe are suffering. We are suffering. In many ways, the global church feels as though it is in exile in a very real sense. Most every church I know is anxious right now. Williamsburg Baptist Church is not the only one. Whether churches are worshiping in person, in parking lots, or entirely online, or somewhere in between, churches are anxious. Churches are scared that numbers are down, that giving is down, that people might not come back when the doors are reopened. And yet the promise that God offers through Jeremiah is a word of comfort and a word of hope for all of us. For thus says the Lord, I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. A time is coming when life will begin to feel normal again. It may be a new normal, but we will eventually get to a point where we are out of crisis mode. Until that time, God will continue to provide for us every step of the way. That is who God is, a God who sustains. God has always made a way for people of faith. When a famine hit the world in Genesis, God used Joseph to provide wheat to all who were hungry. When the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, hoping to arrive at the promised land, God provided manna from heaven daily bread for them to eat. In the New Testament, when the crowds gather to hear Jesus speak, and evening comes, Jesus multiplies loaves so that there is more than enough to go around. And on the last night of his life, as Jesus gathers with his friends, he takes a loaf of bread and shares it with them, knowing that the road forward is uncertain but nevertheless confident that God will be with them every step of the way. I will provide for you. I have plans for you, not only to sustain you, but to lead you into a bright future. Church, if you feel like you're in exile right now, hear this, you are not alone. We are not where we want our lives to be. We want to be done with this pandemic. We want to be done with staying at home. We want to be done with virtual school. We want to go back to normal. I don't know what the future holds. It is hard to read the tea leaves right now. Some people are suggesting that it may get worse before it gets better. I don't know. But the word that Jeremiah speaks today asks us to be patient and to find a way to live in the moment right now, 
Don't continue to keep life on hold, but con continue to find things that are life-giving for you and for us right now. Practice gratitude and find goodness in each day. Don't neglect the mission of the church to serve the broader community. There's still good work to do. And finally, trust that God will sustain us, just as God has always provided. That we will have enough daily bread for today, and tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that too. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as we gather at table today and move into the sacred time, we do so with an awareness that Christians all over the world are also gathering today to celebrate communion together. Christians of all denominations, of all political persuasions and races and creeds, we're all gathering at this table. In this shared meal, we find unity in Christ knowing that God sustains us all as people of faith. I would like to invite you, those of you that are watching via YouTube at home, to observe communion with us today. If you are able, I'd encourage you to go raid your pantry and see if you can find something that will serve symbolically as bread and wine, whether it's literal bread and literal juice or wine, or whatever ordinary staples you can find in your pantry even if it's just a cracker and water. Whatever you can find, we want you to feel like you're welcome to participate. Furthermore, I want you to know that Williamsburg Baptist Church believes in an open table. That means that all are welcome here, whether you are a member here or not, whether you're a Baptist or Episcopal or a recovering Methodist or Catholic or skeptic or none of the above. Let us celebrate together. On the night that Jesus gathered together with his friends for a final time, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Take and eat. Take and eat. In the 
the same way, after the meal, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant sealed with my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving work of the risen Lord until he comes again. Let us pray. Gracious God, may we who have received this bread and shared this cup live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may show forth your goodness to all the world. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, receive these words of benediction. Go in peace. And as you go, remember, in the goodness of God, you are born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very hour. And by the goodness of God and love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace.